Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. Well, Jesus has given his church a commission to make disciples of all nations and discipleship must happen in our midst. And so today we are going to go further, you know, still talking about discipleship. Um, but then the things that we are going to be discussing going forward are so important. And if you have anybody who is struggling in this walk of faith, this is the time to invite them to come to church. If you want to be firm in your own foundation as a believer, this is the time to come early. This is the time to invite people. We would be very selfish if we don't invite people to come and hear God's truth and God's word. And so as a church, we must develop this culture of inviting people. Now, one of the best things you can do with your life, perhaps the best thing you can do with your life is to share the good news. Praise the Lord. But God's good news needs the anointing to tell it. Are you following? But natural good news may not need the anointing. You can just go say, hey, I won a lottery. But if you are sharing the good news of God, you need the anointing to be able to tell it. And so this is a time when we must give attention to God's word. Um, I'll just beginning, beginning as an introduction today, just to wet the ground for us. And specifically, what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be looking at the direct words of Jesus Christ. If we say we are disciples of Jesus and we are ignorant of his words, how can we claim to be his disciples indeed? Jesus said, if my words abide in you, if you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed. There are people who claim to be disciples, but then there are also people who are disciples indeed. And sadly, you know, the words of Jesus are under attack, as a matter of fact, even by people in ministry. But there's something I'd love to read to us um, very quickly. If you look at um, 1 Timothy and chapter 6, I think this supports what you were sharing today at the earlier service from verse 3. It says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself." So the words of Jesus are wholesome words, and he is the truth. He is the way and the life. And so if we must have a very firm foundation as believers, it means that we must be acquainted with his words. His words must be seeds that have been planted in our hearts. As a matter of fact, this is Satan's greatest interest in our lives. The parable of the sower tells us that when the word of the kingdom is sown, when it is shared, the Bible says, anyone who does not understand it, the birds of the air will come and steal the seed, and it will not bring forth any fruit. This is his desire, but he has failed in Jesus' name. There is no weapon that is formed against us that will prosper in the name of the Lord Jesus. We'll begin with Mark chapter 1, and I'll just read from verse 1 to verse 15, just as a background. In the beginning, the gospel of Jesus, or the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, 
Then all the land of Judea and those in Jerusalem went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Verse 8. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. We're going to be talking about the kingdom of God today. I'll just be introducing you to the kingdom and the concept of a kingdom is a concept that is foreign to so many of us because we never really lived in one before. Even as God's children, we are born into the kingdom of God. But you see, just like every nation and every country where you have to be familiar with the laws of that land to actually thrive in the land, if you don't know how the kingdom of God operates, you may be in the kingdom but you not live the kind of life that God will have us live. Now, the kingdom of God would always manifest the power of God and the glory of God in our lives. And if it manifests the glory of God in our lives, what it means is that the kingdom of God will ensure that we live the highest possible quality of life, and that is the life of God. You know, there are different kinds of life. I mean, in your basic biology, you must have learned about plant life, animal life, human life. But there is a God kind of life, and that is what the kingdom of God brings us into. So we are privileged to be able to live the kind of life that God lives. So as we go on, we'll be looking at the lifestyle of this kingdom. How do the citizens of this kingdom live? What is their mission? How does this kingdom grow? What is the future of this kingdom? How do people in the community of God's kingdom live? These are the things that we're going to be looking out for. And as we see a lot of things happening in time, you know, of course I'm, I believe that everybody should be aware of what is happening in Israel today. And you go online and you see a lot of people on social media. I can imagine, even though I've not really been, you know, there in a while, that people will be writing all sorts of things. But you see, as believers, we need to understand the future of the kingdom that we belong to. Because these things are the things that will help us have the peace of God. Not just peace with God, but the peace of God in our lives. Because Jesus said we should follow him that we might not walk in darkness. And we walk rather in the light of life. You know, so a lot of people are postulating all sorts types of things. A lot of people are theorizing all sorts of things. And this is why the words of Jesus are very crucial because Jesus never left us in doubt about the things that would happen. He was very clear about the things that would happen. You know, it reminds me of a few years back when the COVID pandemic came up. Some people were wondering, is this the end of the world? What is happening? A lot of people were confused all sorts of prophecies that never really materialized, you know, and all sorts of things. But you see, it's important as God's people, if we say that we are disciples of Jesus, then we must know what he said. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all 
that I have commanded you. So this is our focus. What has he commanded? What has he said? Really? And he said, lo, I will be with you even on to the end of the age. And so when we are in the truth, we can have a personal guarantee of Jesus Christ that he will be with us till the end. And so your hearts will be in perfect peace when your minds are stationed on him. Now we can't afford to live our lives by hearsay, by the things we see on t- television, the things that BBC is telling us and CNN is telling us, and the things we hear people around us say. We can't afford to live our lives that way. But man must live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Now the first thing I would love us to appreciate is that there are true kingdoms and there are untrue kingdoms. But sadly, most of us are very familiar with the untrue kingdoms. There is something, there are some characteristics that must be present for a kingdom to be a real kingdom, a genuine kingdom. And many of us have never lived in one, naturally speaking, even though we are born into one spiritually. But naturally, there are few people who have really lived in a true kingdom. Yeah, there are some kingdoms, very few, that we may class as true kingdoms based on you know, the characteristics of that kingdom. But you see, even nations like the United Kingdom today is not a real kingdom. Are you following me? And I'll help, by God's grace, you know, show you and help you understand the difference between the true and the untrue kingdoms. You see, people in the United Kingdom can afford to live every day of their lives without thinking of their king. They make decisions every day of their lives and they don't even care about what the king thinks. So truly, what we have there is not really a true kingdom, but it's what we can describe as a constitutional monarchy. They have a constitution that upholds, you know, a figure called a king or a queen. But that king or queen does not rule. He just, he or she just reigns. Are you following? So the first thing for any kingdom to be a true kingdom is that the king must reign and must rule. But what we have today is ceremonial kings and ceremonial queens who reign, but they don't rule. In other words, they don't have a say in the day-to-day lives of the citizens of the kingdom that they reign over. Are you following me? If I move to the United Kingdom today, I can ignore King Charles all my life there. But in a true kingdom, the king can never be ignored. And the day-to-day lives of the citizens, the king has to be consulted. The king can never be ignored. But you see, over there, you know, what we have is that whenever there's any public occasion, the king or the queen will just be wheeled out. And of course, for that moment, they will enjoy the ceremony and all of that. You know, I looked forward to the coronation of King Charles. In fact, I recorded it, as a matter of fact. Because I was interested in a lot that will be done. For those of you who watched it, you will find out that a lot of the things that proceeded, first of all, it was a religious ceremony. All right? And a lot of the passages that were read, the citations, were actually from the Bible. But you see, what we have there is not a real kingdom. And because we've never lived in one, we find it difficult to appreciate what a true kingdom is. So we relate with God almost the same way we relate with these natural monarchs around us. The king or the queen does not have a final say in the United Kingdom. But their value basically is in the power that they they, they keep away from the people. There are certain things that, you know, have been assigned to them by virtue of that position. For example, the courts are under the British monarchy. The Royal Air Force, the army, all of those are under the British monarchy. But you see, in the living of death, there are people who will live there and for all they will be born there, they will die there and they will never have spoken to the monarch once. They may never have even seen the monarch once. In a true kingdom, that's impossible. You can't live your day-to-day life without the influence of the king. 
Otherwise, you are not yet in a true kingdom. So the very first thing is that there must be a king and a king who reigns and rules. A king whose words are law and cannot be contested. It's in a true kingdom, people don't vote. There's no elections in a true kingdom. So you are not obedient, you are not beatified, and you are not articulated. Are you following? I mean, for those who are in Nigeria, you understand that. But those who are listening to me internationally, I mean, these are just the followers of the foremost um, presidential aspirants in the recently concluded Nigerian election. So you, in a kingdom, there's nothing like being obedient, in quotes, or being beatified, or being articulated, because it's not by votes. You don't vote a king in, and you don't vote him out. And the king's law and words cannot be contested. So there's no opposition, there's no division in a true kingdom. The words of the king cannot be debated. They are not subject to debate. And that brings me to the next thing that is very important for a true kingdom to be, is that there must be citizens of that kingdom who are subject to the king. Outside of that submission to the king, there's really no true kingdom. And so when you look at the world around us, in the Bible days, they understood it perfectly, because back then, all the nations were actually governed by kings, and kings who ruled. Are you following me? So when Jesus came and he began to talk about the kingdom of God, they understood what he was talking about. But you see, over the years, even in Europe, I think between uh, the 1900s and today, there are over 24 crown rulers that are no longer crown rulers anymore. More and more, the world is tilting towards democracy, which is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, as it is defined, but that is far from a kingdom. When you look in the scriptures, you find out that there's no room for democracy in it. Are you following? And then, you know, we have this contrast. If we are born into a kingdom and we live naturally in a nation that is go governed democratically, how do we live? This is why it will be important for you to understand the parables of Jesus because he showed how you can actually coexist. Are you following? But ultimately, what will happen is that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God. Are you following this? Now, it's so crucial that the subjects of God's kingdom are obedient to the sovereign. They are obedient to God. If we have not yet settled this, Jesus is teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And he said, lo, I'm with you even unto the end of the age. You know, so it's so crucial. And so if God is sovereign, it means that God is king. God rules. God does not just reign, but he rules. In other words, he can tell us how to live our lives because he's king. And in many nations of the world, many languages of the world, the word king is the same word as God. So if you go to a, 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 any of these languages and you say king, they will naturally feel that you are referring to God. They are the same word. So this is the difficulty that we face living in the kingdom of God because we don't really appreciate what this kingdom is, what it stands for, and this is the essence of discipleship. This is the reason why the church is losing its saltiness in many instances. This is the reason why we're not shining as the light that we should shine. We should be. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, so all through, we're all familiar with the human ways of kingdoms. And so we see, we deal with God as if we're dealing with a president. Are you following me? Of course, you know how we treat our presidents. Many times we dishonor, even though that should not be the case. But you see people cracking jokes about the president of their land, making fun. And it's the same way we treat God. There are people who mock God. And people find it difficult. You see, God is king. God is king over the universe. God is king over the nations of the earth. God is king over history. God is the one who started history and is the one who determines what happens in history. There's no election that, that holds in this world that God does not have the casting votes and does not have the final say. So, but 
we now begin to wonder if God is a God who is all powerful and a God is a God who is loving. Why is the earth the way it is? Why are the nations the way they are? Because many times when you look at it, it's as if God is not in control. When you see a lot of things that happen in the world, you see wars, rumors of wars, you see earthquakes, you see famine, you see hunger, you see injustice in the land. And so you begin to wonder. But let me tell you, and make no mistakes about it, God rules in the affairs of men. And there is nothing that happens that takes him by surprise. Absolutely nothing. But the reason why we're in this situation is simply because of rebellion to the kingdom of God. Why are the nations of the world tilting more towards democracy? Because democracy gives the people the power to live as they want. They can challenge the stand of a president. I mean, if the people in, the, in Nigeria, we have the Senate and we have the House of Assemblies. If the people don't like the stand of a the president, they can challenge him. And it's majority that carries the votes. If majority of the people are having a warped mindset, that's the direction everybody will go. But a kingdom, the quality of life in a kingdom depends on the character of the king of that kingdom. And this is why you can get no better quality than the life of God. Where God himself is the monarch. Where God himself is the king. Where God himself is the sovereign in our lives. And we recognize him to be so. And we obey him as such. And we honor him as such. You will find out that life will take a new meaning altogether. But we relate with God as if we are relating with some of these our natural leaders around us. In fact, when you think about the kingdoms on earth, there are very few of them that are real. The closest to real kingdoms might just be maybe Saudi Arabia, where you have a king who truly reigns and he rules. Are you following? And it's not surprising, and maybe places like Jordan, it's not surprising that those are Middle Eastern nations. Are you following me? Because back then, you find out that Israel will always war with the king of Og, the king of Bashan, the king of the Edomites, and nations then were actually ruled by kings. But today, we are far departed from that structure, so we find it difficult to really appreciate what the kingdom of God is. And the simple reason why we're in this mess is because of rebellion to the kingdom of God. And so even in our personal lives, you see, let me tell you what sin is. Sin is simply a declaration of an independence from God. Are you following? When, a, when an individual says, I can live independent of God, that is sin. And this is the reason for the chaos and the mess in our world today, because there's a lot of rebellion against God. Many people want to serve God in their own terms and not on his own terms. A true kingdom does not work that way. And this understanding is extremely important if you will capture the things that Jesus tell us, tells us. If you are going to understand the things that Jesus says to us, then you must realize that it's not subject to debate. It's not subject to controversy. It's not subject to arguments. But for there to be a true kingdom, there must be obedience to the sovereign. And because he's a good God, one without flaw, one without imperfection, one that is unjust, you can be sure that everything he orders you to do is right and just. A God in whom there is no flaw. You see, when you look at the life of Jesus, you find out that Jesus was dependent on the Father. He never did anything in his life independent of his Father. And that is true kingdom life. This is where God is calling us to. Where in our day-to-day -day decisions, we consult God. We won't be like people who are living in the United Kingdom and don't even care about what the wishes of their king is. But whenever there's a ceremony, you see the king will just come out, they will clap, they will honor him and all of that. But he cannot tell somebody on the streets how to live their life. 
And when that person is making decisions, they will never refer to the king. But in the kingdom of God, it's different. Every day of our lives, we are dependent on God. And if you want to understand this, read the Gospels. Observe Jesus. Jesus says, the things I tell you are the things I hear my father tell me. The things I do are the things I see my father doing. In fact, when you look at the Gospels, particularly John, and you see how many times Jesus will refer to his father, it's amazing. And this is what is missing more often than not in a lot of our lives. Many times we run our lives. If we are the boss of our lives, if we are the ones ruling our lives, then we have missed kingdom living. So first of all, we must come to that place. That's why he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, is within reach. Repent and believe the gospel. And so there's so much rebellion against the kingdom of God. So much. Even in our personal lives, many a times, there are many kings, I mean kingdoms that are being created by men. You know, in our own ways, you know, if, if we had a choice, you know, many people would not want to be employed by anybody. Why? So that nobody tells them what to do and they can determine how they work and how they would live their lives. If people had a way, they wouldn't want an employer. Are you following what I'm saying? They would rather be the ones that call the shots in their lives. But you see, as God's people, it's a different case for us. We can no longer call the shots in our lives. When we were in the world, in the time of ignorance, God winked. But now he commands everyone to come to repentance. None of us can run our lives ourselves. As a matter of fact, by now you should know that you are very bad at running your life. Because (laughs) there are ways that seem right unto men, but at the end is destruction. And this is why he has given us a spirit to lead us, to guide us, to run our lives. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So much rebellion. So in our own little houses, we want to be the king and the queens. We don't want God to tell us how to live our family lives. As a husband, you believe you are the man of the house. Jesus can't tell you anything. You run your house the way you run, want to run it. In your businesses, you feel, oh, I'm the one in charge. I'm the MD CEO. I can do anything I like in this business. I'm the one that started it. Politicians do the same thing. You come in and you feel you can run a nation as you like. And this is the reason why people like democracy. Because they can put people in and they can kick them out. But with a king, you can't do that. 